Greetings, everyone. I'm going to go over the solutions from our first uh, practice exam that we took last week. And if you're in period four, you're going to have a different order of the questions. You have the same questions are just not ordered in the same way. So um, don't worry about it. Just, you know, understand how, you know, which one, what it was numbered for you and what the answers are and how to get the right answers. That's the most important thing. So for for this number one here, we have uh, this continuous function on the closed interval negative 5, 5. The graph of f consists of a parabola and two line segments as shown above, a GB uh, function such as g prime is equal to f. So this uh, is the derivative of g, or g is an antiderivative of lowercase f. We're going to fill in the missing values uh, for uh, f prime and f double prime on these intervals here. And so just by reading the graph and giving an explanation um, for what we see. And so let's go ahead and do this. So um, let's talk F prime first. So F prime, and uh, this is part A for this question. F prime is greater than zero on... So we're looking at the graph of f. So we want to see where f is increasing. So f is increasing. Uh, that's the first interval, negative 5 to negative 3, and then from negative 1 to 2. So I go negative 5 to negative 3, unioned with negative 1 to 2. And then just say why, because f prime is increasing on these intervals. And then you can say f prime is less than zero. Now, any of these are positive, negative, but this means the same thing. And if you are uh, if you have the table to edit, then you can type in positive or negative. Um, but what I'm saying is mathematically the same and uh, easier to probably just easier to write or type this this way. Um, so now on the interval from negative three to negative one, then f prime is going to be negative because f is decreasing. Same thing on three, rather two to five. So negative three to negative one and two to five. That's when uh, f prime is negative because, and I made a mistake here. This should be f is increasing on these intervals, and down here f is decreasing. So Excuse me, I'm trying to go too quickly sometimes and I misspeak or miswrite. So I usually catch it at some point. Going to do the same thing for F double prime. A lot of people made the mistake on the, the, the linear portions. Okay, so on those two pieces, F double prime is zero on the interval, the first interval from uh, negative five to negative three unioned with two to five. Those are the linear pieces here because if I take the derivative the derivative of this linear piece, what I get is a slope or constant for whatever this the slope of this line is. That's what I get for the derivative. Take the second derivative, the derivative of a constant is zero. Same thing over here. I get a negative number for the slope over here on this linear piece. Take the derivative of that negative number and it's the same negative number all over the place. It's constant and so uh, you get zero again. A lot of you said, well, I don't know what you said. It's just wrong, okay? Um, so, and you can say something like, there's a number of ways you could say this, but I, I would say because the second derivative of a constant No, actually, I'm saying this wrong here. I'm too busy paying attention to my dog. I assume she's dragging back and forth. I'd say something like this because f prime is a constant. This is what I want. So f double prime is equal to zero. And then we could say on. Um, uh, f time f double prime is greater than zero on this is going to be the middle intervals here uh, negative three to negative one uh, union with negative one to five uh, I'm sorry to two 
because we have that parabola in there, um, F is concave upward. Okay, on those on uh, those intervals, I'm not sure. Um, you could you should be able to combine. They broke them down into separate intervals in the table, so that's why I broke them down into separate intervals here. Uh, but you could put one interval from negative three to two and make the same statement. But you're, since we're filling in the table, I broke it up into two separate pieces. Now that's a three point question. Uh, you know, so you get a point for your f prime, a point for f double prime, and a point for the explanation or something like that. You can get if you get all of f double prime wrong, then you can still get two points. Uh, out of it for getting f prime and and uh, the explanation correct. So, um, but that's how that works. Now, part B says there is no value x in the open interval negative one five at which f prime is equal to this expression right here. Explain why this does not violate the mean value theorem. So, uh, a good number of you got this, but some of you didn't. I was happy for those who did. Um, those of you who didn't looked at this uh, open interval and thought, oh, it can't be an open interval. The conclusion of the mean value theorem is an open interval. Then there exists a C in the open interval AB such that, and you get that F prime of C is equal to F of B minus F of A over B minus A. But there are two conditions that are needed for the mean value theorem. The function has to be continuous. It is, they told us that. The function also has to be differentiable. And if you look at the graph, it's not. To be differentiable, it cannot have any sharp turns. I did say at one point that there are three ways a function can fail to be differentiable. One, if it's not continuous, doesn't apply here. Two, if there are any sharp turns, like the absolute value graph, and then the function is not going to be differentiable. So this function is not differentiable here and here. The third way a function can fail to be differentiable is if it has a vertical tangent line at some point. And so, um, which again, doesn't apply to this one. So the answer to this one, and this is the one point question, um, just you have to say something like this, uh, this does not violate the mean value theorem. Because the function is not differ, differentiable due to the sharp turns or something like that it's a one point question if you say something like that you're going to get the credit for it for part c it says find all values of x in the open interval negative five five at which the graph of g has a point of inflection here a lot of you went wrong with the point of inflection um, because you just said that you uh, just find the places where G double prime is equal to zero or just where G double prime does not exist. And that's not the definition of a, uh, of a point of inflection. Okay. We go looking for points of inflection where the second derivative is zero and where the second derivative does not exist. We go looking there, but we have to make sure the second derivative changes sign at those points because it's possible. And here is a counter example that I gave you guys at one point. If I go to x to the fourth, okay, it looks like a just a widened parabola, a little bit fatter parabola here at the bottom. The second derivative is equal to zero here, but there's no change in concavity. So there is no point of inflection at zero for this graph. And so it's not good enough to say that just that the second derivative is zero. We have to make sure that the second derivative changes sign. And so we can do that uh, in just a moment. Let's go back and look at the graph really quickly. So since g prime is equal to f, g double prime is going to be f prime. OK, so I'm looking to see where F, F prime does not exist or where F prime equals zero. Well, F prime is not going to exist at this sharp turn here and at this sharp turn here. OK, so those are two values where we have potential points of inflection. And then um, G double prime equals zero or F prime is a horizontal tangent or F has a horizontal tangent where F prime is equal to zero. And that's occurring at the base of the, or the vertex of the parabola right here. So we have three potential points. I just got to make sure that concavity changes or the, the, the sign of the second derivative changes at those points. Now look at, look at what's going on here. So, the graph of f is increasing 
at this point. So it means F prime is positive. That's G double prime is positive right through here. And then the graph of F starts to decrease. So F prime is negative or G double prime is negative. So G double prime goes from positive to negative at negative three, X equals negative three. So there is going to be a point of inflection there. Similarly, at negative one, G double prime is going to be negative through here since the graph of F is decreasing and positive after since the graph of F is increasing. So at X equals negative one, we'll have another point of inflection and also at two because the graph is uh, increasing then decreasing. So G double prime or F prime is going to be positive and then negative. So we can just go back and, and type that up. OK, and so. Uh, there are points of inflection. Notice they didn't ask for Y values. Uh, that's important to note because you don't want to type in a Y value that you don't know. You don't know the Y values of G. You haven't calculated those. Um, and so don't, don't use those. I hope I'm remembering this correctly. I think it was negative one and two. My dog wants to play right now, so. Hopefully she'll let me finish this video. Um, let me go check the graph again to make sure I didn't miss remember those those uh, values. No, that's right. Uh, because the graph, let's say it this way actually, because f prime. No, I'm going to use f because f changes from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing at these values. All right, let's get on to part D. At what value of G, excuse me, what value of X does G attain its absolute maximum on this interval from um, negative five to five. So for this one here, um, notice that the graph is always, the graph of F G prime is always above the horizontal axis or maybe uh, including uh, at or above because it's hitting the, the horizontal axis at negative five and five. But this means that G prime, which is equal to F, is always greater than or equal to zero. And so G is always increasing. And if a graph is always increasing, its maximum has to occur at the right hand endpoint because it's always going up. So at the left, it's going to be less than at the right. So, so the absolute max occurs at the right hand endpoint x equals five. And there's that question. So let's uh, let's go back and put something uh, some things in here. So we said the first question was uh, for answering all that was worth three points. Part B was worth one point. That's four. And so there's still five more points out there. Uh, this, I believe, was two points for D. And I think C was worth three points. Uh, uh, yeah, that sounds right. All right, I'm going to pause the video for a minute. All right, for the next question, uh, it says consider, consider the curve defined by Y squared minus X squared Y equals six. Why, I don't know, why am I, hmm. Now my pen doesn't seem to want to work. There we go. Y squared minus X, Y squared is equal to six. I think my brain has now been too far away from it. Uh, no, it's X squared Y. And then y is positive, so I'll move this two over here. Now in part A, well, I'm having some technical issues here. Hopefully this won't continue. 
in part A, they give you what the derivative is and they want you to show that. The reason why they do this is because you're going to need that derivative to answer questions later on. And so if you can't get it, they don't want you to not be able to answer the questions later on. So instead of just asking you to find the derivative to implicitly differentiate here, they're going to say, this is what the derivative is. Can you show that this is true? So you got to show enough work. Okay. So they want to see that you implicitly differentiate with respect to X. They want to make sure that you do all of the correct, you know, uh, steps, chain rule, product rule, that sort of stuff. So differentiating Y squared with respect to X is going to be two Y times Y prime or DY over DX. And then minus, and then we're going to take the derivative of, you can put this in parentheses, derivative of x squared is going to be 2x and then times y plus, and then x squared times dy over dx. And then on this side, we get, we're going to get 0. And then you got to show some algebra, not a ton, you know, but just make sure you're showing enough steps that they understand that you can get the correct answer. And so we're going to bring the 2xy over to this side. So we're going to add that over. And then we're going to factor out the dy over dx from the other two terms. And then we'll do a little bit of division. And then that's it. They want you just to, you know, they want to see those things. Okay. And that was, I don't remember how many points that was. That was two or three. I don't remember off the top of my head. Uh, we had to write the equation for the tangent line to the curve at the point one, three. Uh, a lot of you got the Y coordinate wrong on this one. They give you the point. It's one, three. A lot of you used six. I don't know where the six came from. Well, maybe because it says equals six, but um, that shouldn't have been an issue. Um, so dy over dx at, 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 at the uh, point uh, 1, 3, at the point 1, 3, we're going to calculate the slope. So we're going to plug in 1 for x and 3 for y. So we get 6 here and we get 6 minus 1, so 5. And then it's going to be six fifths minus or times the quantity x minus one plus three. Again, I don't know where some of you got the six from over here, unless you you thought the six that the whole original equation was equal to somehow was the y coordinate. But I think that was a two point question. Yeah, it was a two point question. One for the slope and one for the equation. Part C says to show that the that there is a point P at which the x coordinate zero. I'll read it correctly in a moment. Show that there's a point P with x coordinate zero at which the line tangent to the curve at P is horizontal. Then find the y coordinate of P. Okay. So a lot of you did this wrong because you used the the tangent line. You shouldn't be using the tangent line here. You got to be using the curve. OK, so your, your tangent line you found up here has nothing to do with this problem. Um, so there's a point P with with X coordinate zero, which the uh, line tangent to the curve is horizontal. OK, so horizontal means that the slope is going to be zero and dy over dx. We're going to have this at zero. So I'll put zero in, I mean, at x equals zero. So I'll put zero in for x. And then we want to set that equal to zero so that the, we get it that it's horizontal. And... Actually, I'm doing this out of order here because my dog's distracting me. Before I do that, we're going to do that in just a moment. We have to verify that. I need the original equation. So we got y squared minus x squared. Y is equal to 6. I don't know if you can hear her chains rattling over here. At x equals 0, we're going to get y squared minus 0 is equal to 6. 
So we're going to get y equals plus or minus the square root of 6. But remember they told us that y was positive. So we don't want the negative root 6. We only want the positive root 6. And then once we have that, then we got to go back and, and verify that, that we do, in fact, have a slope of 0 at that point. So it's going to be 2 times 0 times the square root of 6 over the square root of 6 quantity squared minus 0. And because the numerator is 0 and the denominator is not, we get that. So you needed two things on this one. You needed both the, to get the, the y corner of the point, and then you needed to show that it does equal 0 at that point. So both of those things were needed. And then lastly, we want to find the derivative at the point found, or the second derivative at the point found in part, um, in part C. So we already know the derivative is 2xy, because they gave this to us, over y squared minus x squared. No over 2y minus x squared, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> is that true? Did I, ever, did I copy this down wrong? I did. Uh, it should be 2y minus x squared. Yep. This down here should be 2. This 2 should be over here, but it still works out to be 0. I'm just going too fast and I have too many distractions. All right, so now we're going to get the second derivative by... Doing the quotient rule, so low d high, so we get 2y minus 2x times dy over dx minus high 2xy d low, which is going to be 2 times dy over dx uh, minus x, uh, going d low, so 2x. And then all this over 2y minus x squared squared. And then we want to do this at the point that we found, which is 0 times root or 0 comma root 6 from the previous one. Now remember, that's the point, but we also know at that at that point, dy over dx has to be 0 because uh, that's what we found. So all of these things are going to be true. The x coordinate we're going to plug in is going to be 0. The y coordinate is root 6. And for dy over dx, we're going to plug in 0. So 2 times y, so 2 times root 6, minus 0 squared. I'm not going to do anything with that. 2y, so 2 root 6, minus, well, x is 0 and dy over dx is 0. So that's all 0. I don't need that. 2xy, that's 0. I'm just going to put a big 0 there so we can see it. And then down here in the denominator, we got 0 here. And so this is going to be 2 root 6 quantity squared. But that's 2 root 6 times 2 root 6 over 2 root 6 times 2 root 6. So that works out to be just 1. So for this one here, they wanted you to take the derivative. I think this was three points, if I remember correctly. Two points for doing the, the quotient rule and the chain rule correctly. So getting this expression up here. One more point for plugging in all of this, all of this data and showing that you get one as the result. All right, let's go to the last question here. We're given this graph here. Um, the graph consists... The graph of the function f on the closed interval negative 3, neg uh, negative 3, less than or equal to x, less than or equal to 8, consists of six line segments, and the point 5, 2 is shown in the graph in the figure above. The function g is given by that polynomial. It is known that you get the definite integral from negative 3 to negative 1 of g is negative 4.8. Definite integral from negative 3 to 4 of g is 11.2. Find the value of the definite integral from 4 to 8 of f of x dx, or explain why the integral does not exist. A lot of you made a mistake here because you thought because the function not being continuous means that, um, I'm trying to write and talk and I shouldn't do that. Yeah, that is f of x. 
that uh, this value isn't going to exist. And that's not true. This means you cannot do the fundamental theorem of algebra or the evaluation theorem to get the answer to this because the function's not continuous. But you, this still has meaning in the picture from, from four to eight. This is just the area under the curve. Um, this point here doesn't affect the area. So I just got to find the area of this region and the area of this region and add them together. So this, this does have a value. Uh, I think this is just a one point question. So those of you who said, no, you lost that point. And those of you who got the answer got, you know, got the value. Um, but all you need to do is just, you know, essentially find the area, uh, find those areas and add them together. So if you want to find these areas here, um, if you just count squares, there's two squares here, a half a square here, I guess it's two and a half. And if you look at this, these two squares, this diagonal cuts this, these two squares in half. So this is just one, okay, or two times one divided by two. So this is one. So one for this triangle, two, three and a half. So this is just three and a half. And that's it. So remember, just because the function's not continuous doesn't mean there's no area there. It means you can't do the fundamental theorem. That's different, okay? The fundamental theorem doesn't work in that case to get the answer to that. B, find the value of, there's two parts to this, uh, integral from negative one to four of g of x with respect to x, that's the first part. And then, some manipulatives there show the work leads to your answer. You don't need to take uh, the antiderivative of this thing and do the fundamental theorem up here for this because they give you these two properties right over here. Um, and you can use these two properties to get the answer to this. In other words, I can break this up. I can do something. Now, I know negative three is not in this interval, but if I think about it like this, if I do the integral from negative three to negative one, uh, of g of x. No, actually, that's, this is a bad way to explain it. Let me start over here a little bit. I, I want to be a little clearer. Since they give us the values uh, from negative, they give us the value from negative three to four of g of x. I could break that up into negative three to negative one of g of x dx plus the integral from negative one to four of g of x dx. Okay. So now I'm looking for the integral from negative one to four. I'm looking for this one. So if I subtract this integral from both sides, I can get the answer uh, to this using those values that they gave me instead of having to find antiderivatives. So the integral from negative one to four of g of x dx is going to be the integral from negative three to four of g of x dx minus the integral from negative three to negative one of g of x dx. And then if I go back to what they told me, the integral from negative three to four was 11.2. And the integral from negative three to negative one is negative 4.8. And if I add those together, I get 16. Now, the second part is each of these were worth one, by the way. We have the same limits of integration, but now it's 2 times g minus 4 times f. So it's the integral from negative 1 to 4, 2 times g of x minus four times f of x. Now here they want to see you do manipulations on uh, uh, the integral here, like we did in section 5.2. So they want you to pull it apart, factor out, pull apart the subtraction, factor out the, uh, mul the multiplier like this. And then do some substitution here. We just found that the integral from negative 1 to 4 for g of x was 16. So this is going to be 2 times 16 minus 
And the integral from negative 1 to 4 for f, I don't think we've done that one yet. No, we haven't done that one yet. So this is going to be 4 times, well, let's go look at the picture. Of, we're on negative 1 to 4. So from negative 1 to 4, we have this triangle here, which has a base of 2 and a height of 2. So 2 times 2 divided by 2. And it's above the x-axis, so it's positive. And then we have this triangle here, which has a base of 3 and a height of 2. Base of 3 and a height of 2. But it's uh, below the x-axis, so we're going to subtract. So we end up with 32 minus 4 times, what's this? This is 2 minus 3. That's negative 1, so this is going to end up being 36. I'm trying to get this done during lunchtime here, so I'm going to keep going. Um, let h be g, piecewise defined function. Uh, h of x is equal to g of x or f of x plus b, depending on where we are. And this is x less than or equal to negative 1. And x greater than negative 1. Find the value of the integral of h from negative 3 to 4. No, I'm sorry, I didn't say that. Find the value of b for which the integral of h is going to be 14.2. Uh, Again, this is more just manipulation here. Notice h is divided up around negative 1. So if I divide this up around negative 1 using uh, one of our integral properties, now I can actually substitute in. In place of the h here, from negative 3 to negative 1, that's less than or equal to negative 1. I'm going to use g of x. So this is the integral from negative 3 to negative 1 of g of x dx plus, and then from negative 1 to 4, that's f of x plus b. Now, I'm just going to leave this alone for a moment, and I'll come back and substitute that value in. Here, how do I deal with this? Well, this is the integral from negative 1 to 4 of f of x dx, which I think we found a moment ago, plus the integral of a constant, negative 1 to 4 of b with respect to x. Um, going back up here for a moment. We found the integral from negative 1 to 4 for g of x is 16. Oh, we need negative 3 to negative 1, though. From negative 3 to negative 1... That's the negative 4.8. So we'll put that in here. For f, the negative from negative 1 to 4. I apologize for all this scrolling here. Hopefully it's not making you dizzy. I just don't know where it is. Oh, negative 1 to 4 of f. That's all this stuff in here. That was negative 1. So minus 1. And then this thing here, this is just b times 5 right here. Why 5? Because to go from horizontally negative 1 to 4, it's 5. So whatever b is, we're going to go from negative 1 to 4. That's a rectangle with a base of 5 and a height of b. b could be negative. I don't know. Uh, we'll just leave it like that for now. And this has to be equal to, they told us, 14.2. And so b, or 5b, is going to be equal to, uh, this is negative 5.2, or negative 5.8 right here. When I combine this, when I add 5.8 over here, I'm going to get 20. So that means b is equal to 4. I think that's a three-point question. It might be a two-point question. And then one more before lunchtime ends, and i got to go to class for fifth period. Limit as x approaches 1. Uh, 
And then we got uh, f of x over g of x plus 2. So if we go back to the graph and look at uh, the limit of f of x as x approaches 1, that's going to 0. So this is going to 0 over, and g of x they gave us. So um, they never actually calculated it yet, but um, I'm just running out of time here. 1 tenth. And then we got 4x cubed plus 3x squared. And then minus 10x minus 17. And then if I plug in 1 here, we're going to get 4 plus 3, which is 7. Uh, minus 10, which is um, 7 minus 10, negative 3. Minus 17, negative 20, divided by... 10 is negative 2, so then plus 2 we get 0, so that means we've got to apply L'Hopital's rule. And so after we apply L'Hopital's rule, limit as x approaches 1, we're going to get f prime of x on top. On the bottom, that 2 goes to 0. Some of you left it in there. This would be g prime of x here. So the limit as x approaches 1. Um, I'm going to leave f prime of x alone. They want to see g prime. g prime is going to be 1 tenth. And then this is going to be 12x squared plus 6x minus 10. This is going to be f prime of 1, which is not 0. Down here, I'm going to get 12 plus 6, which is 18. 18 minus 10 is 8, so I get 8 tenths or 4 fifths. I got to go back to the graph and get f prime of 1. Since this is a line through here and the slope is negative 2, this is going to be negative 2 over 4 fifths. And then that's going to be what? Negative 10 fourths or negative 5 halves. Sorry, that was a little quick, but class starts in like 3 4 minutes. All right, everyone, go study.